yeah, there's, there are those parts that just sparkle. Like you were asking about those visions that I had and stuff like that. Those are definitely sparkle. Like, oh, I just want to live in this space. And then there are seasons where it's not there. And, and yeah, that definitely does have a flow to it. Um, and I've seen, I've seen over time that my work is to continue to trust, to trust the flow even when I can't feel the flow, even when it's not coming out as big sparkles in my life yeah. and understanding. But I think, I, I think that courage muscle gets strengthened over time, the courage to follow that, mm -hmm. the courage to wait for that patient and through patience for that time. Um, and there really is always, there always is some affirmation coming back to me. Like even if I don't feel like I'm sitting in those spaces of, yeah, this is right. I'm not hearing those audible yes, no's in my head um, or that feeling in my gut of affirmation. Even if I'm not feeling those things, you, there often are still signs around to pay attention even if they're small that things are, things are happening. And I actually keep a journal to, um, in those times too, to just try to write down just some of those kind of examples for me, just to remind me and bring it in. Or, or a flow, uh, a color. Sometimes I like to even just put things into a color, like think that this is, you know, like right now this is like a purple season in my life. Or like how, and then to watch out for how purple shows up. You know, crazy ways that we kind of look for that, um, that mirroring back of spirit. Because it's all necessary. We can't live in those high places for that. We're not meant to live in those high places. Because I can also see the times when I've lived in those highs too. I can easily start to just kind of get complacent or, uh, or somehow flow into ego thinking, see, this is it. You're doing this. You're listening and look what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, like the ego can easily take over and those aren't helpful either. So, yeah. You talked about the, the courage muscle. What is the role of courage? Yeah. I think we can all listen to the flow of the spirit. We can all feel it within us. But we have to, at some point, it always calls us for the courage to leap into it. And it's always a leap into the known. Um, so, so that was a time when I decided then to quit teaching and um, to stay home with my then young son. Um, and during that time then, I thought, oh, I'm kind of bored. So I ended up getting into direct sales. I wanted to do something just to get myself out in the evening. So I thought I'd do this. And all of a sudden, I had this thriving direct sales business. And I was top performer for all Canada. I did for five years. We got free trips all over the place. I loved it. It was wonderful. And then I got to the point where, yeah, I felt that knocking again. And like, why? This doesn't make sense. Like I feel like everything about this is on top of my game. Everything on the outside seems like it's on top of the game. But what does this look like? And um, so once again, I had the, I'd made the courage to step away from that. And, but whenever that, those opportunities for courage comes up, I see how over and over again that the courage, trust in the muscle that you know has led you to the right place before gets strengthened. And the courage to listen to that to not ignore those feelings within, listen to it. So ironically, like even when it came time to, um, when I knew that, you know, th that I was with my partner, I knew that this is where this was heading. Was There was no way I could stay in my marriage anymore. Um, and I had to be honest. I knew I had to be honest. The feeling was so strong in me that I knew I had to be honest. Um, and I had to lay my truth out in the light. That feeling was so strong in me that I would say actually it took even less courage, ironically, than it did to leave my teaching position years ago. Mm. Which sounds, uh, it doesn't make sense because obviously the, the ripple effects of, uh, you know, me choosing to leave the marriage was way <laughs> larger than leaving a teaching job. But I had trusted, I think it was that courage muscle, and trusting that that muscle is speaking to you for a reason. You need to, you need to listen to it. So yeah, courage is a muscle. And you, the, more you, the more you use it, the more you see how that it doesn't feel as daunting. It still feels daunting, 
but you can trust that that courage muscle is most definitely leading you to where you need to go in every way. What, what has helped you become more sensitive and responsive to the flow of divine spirit? I think that um, I think knowing that I can't figure things out like, I can't do this on my own. And I need to trust, fully trust, that there's, this is in me for a reason. We are here for a reason. We are here, we're here today for a reason. Like, that there is everything within that. Um, and as far as being more sensitive to it, I found when I am more open and honest about saying, I surrender, I'm listening, then those, I, can, I can hear those tangible. So I'll, I'll take an example. Just about two weeks ago, some pretty uh, drastic events happened in my life. And I had that moment like, I can't do this. I need to surrender. I fully surrender. I fully surrender. And after that point, I just started asking myself when I feel worry start to creep in and I surrender or situations come up, I ask myself questions and I was audibly he able to hear yes or no, which I know sounds, sounds uh, you know, like who, who hears yes or no or know that yes or no, but became, because I saw that it became much more present and I was able to tune into that presence more. So I really think this doesn't go, you don't just surrender and then you're sitting in water hoping that you're not going to drown. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's that you're left that high and dry with surrendering. I think that there are yeses, nos. Um, kind of have this gut meter within myself that I try to, I ask myself, how do you feel about this? And I kind of have a feeling, well, it's feeling like this way or it's feeling like this way. All those kind of ways that I think we all kind of subtly do, but prob maybe don't pay attention. We just don't think of them that way. But we all have those internal guidance systems because I, because the divine lives within us too. Like when we are surrendering, surrendering to all, that's also surrendering to the all that's within us. The capital all that's within us. Like that's really what that is. This isn't saying I'm going to go into a void of an unknown here and you know, you're going to put me in the middle of a desert with nothing to eat or drink. Like there's so much to eat or drink within us but we have to kind of shift our navigation system to trusting what that is within us. And, that's, and that, takes, that takes awareness. I think it takes awareness and it takes a risk. It takes risk of listening to those voices within us that we've been so long taught to deny or to not trust. Can you say more about the, the navigation? internal navigation? Mm -hmm. I, can, I can literally have a dialogue in my head sometimes um, with, I don't know who I'm dialoguing with, whatever I'm dialoguing with higher, and I can literally feel a yes or no. For me sometimes what I do is I think, you know, I ask myself a question like, okay, I'll give an example. So I've been a part of a Sunday morning group that just, we meet for half an hour from 8 to 8.30 every Sunday morning. Um, just meet for a time of stillness. We have 10 minutes that we read. We, you know, our leader brings us something to read. We sit in silence for the other 20 minutes. And then there's 10 minutes for if people want to talk about anything they heard. And then we go on our day. It's a nice grounding practice. We've been doing it you know, through COVID. We've been doing it for a number of months. The last few Sunday mornings, I, was, I just like, slept in. And I never set my alarm. But I was just sleeping in. And I wasn't waking up till like 10 or 10.30. And I thought, this is odd. So I thought, this is it. I'm going to set my alarm. So two Sunday mornings ago, I woke up on a Sunday morning and set my alarm. And I said, OK. And I thought, before I go and do this, because I've missed these people. They've been reaching out to me. They miss me too. And that's great. And I know this is a good grounding practice for me. I just thought, OK, I'm just going to check in with myself. Like, Charlene, you know, should you be going to the Sunday morning thing? And I heard a no. And I just thought, 
This doesn't make sense. I know it's a good grounding process. There's no reason. I'm awake. I will enjoy it. And for all the good reasons, I should go. And so then I do, what I do is a double take. I kind of ask myself, well, maybe the answer is yes. So what does it feel like, Charlene, if the answer is yes, you should go to the Sunday morning thing? And I realized that the yes didn't have the same resonance in my body as the no did. And so that's how, that's how I did the difference. Because if I was doing the difference in my head, heck yeah, I'm going on yes on a Sunday morning. There's no reason not to. And I want to. But to me, my body was clearly resonating with no. It felt comfortable. My body felt comfortable with the no. My mind didn't feel comfortable with the no in any way. I had no idea how I was going to explain this, that once again, Charlene ditched the Sunday morning. But I, I trusted that no. Um, and so it is kind of those little things to trust. Um, and, you know, can I say why? I don't know why that no. I can't say that, oh, well, obviously, looking back now, that no was good because this happened. No, but I, so I just think there was a reason I was hearing that no. And so that, to me, is what flowing with spirit is, is courage and trust, even when the thing, other things don't make sense to say, to listen to that. So, so part of what you're talking about is body awareness. Yeah. And being in tune with your body. And, I mean, you were raised probably similar to Christianity with me. That's, we weren't really taught that. No. And at least I wasn't. Yeah, but, no. And so, so it sounds like that is a practice that you have learned and developed over time. And, that's, mm -hmm. and that is a, a key way that you're able to tune into the divine flow. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So can you talk yeah. more about that journey with body awareness? Yeah, I, I do think it's not something that I've just, um, I don't think it's something that I kind of came to like an epiphany of understanding within myself. But I look back now and I see myself, for instance, in music, so playing. And I often like to just play and just kind of trust and go with the flow. And so I know I was, you know, for years I was playing Sunday morning services and I would plan out what I was going to play for prelude, what I was going to play in my book for offertory, and all those kind of, you know, touch points to play. And I started, speaking of practicing that courage muscle, I decided I'm going to start practicing my courage muscle in this way. So I stopped planning on what I was going to play. I started just kind of trusting that whatever would flow at the time would flow. And it, it was amazing. Always, like often, you know, offertory often came after the sermon. So I would just be sitting there during the sermon thinking, well, I'm pretty sure the sermon's going to be up now, and Charlene, you still have no idea what you play, what you want to play. And then there would be a phrase or two that would pop up, pop out, and all of a sudden I think, oh, that reminds me of that hymn, or reminds me of that song, or whatever. Or this, this is the color, it reminds me, once again, kind of color or feeling. This is the feeling I have from it. So this is where I'm going to go and going to trust that flow. So I think that started there for me. Um, and then the other thing too that I did, because you know, and you'll know as a musician, kind of when you get into, if you, you get into improvising or playing or just kind of going the flow, I can fall into patterns. We all fall into patterns, kind of play things the same way, or you know, we know how the music, we're raised in a Western culture that we know what the chord structure is, all those kind of reasons that we fall into those patterns. So I started specifically kind of putting obstacles in my way. So if I would choose that, okay, offertory, I'm just going to go with the flow. I know I'm going to do it in D major. I know I'm going to start out these are the three, first three notes I'm going to do. After that, I don't know. So I would be doing that. I get in that place. And then I would trust, and then I would go along, and I think, as I'm playing along, I'm thinking, yep, you're getting right back into the patterns. Again, that's right back into the patterns. And I would force myself to go to a chord that I couldn't hear what was coming next. I kind of put myself in those obstacle places. And, and I think that those, you know, as silly as those little things sound, that helped me practice going with the flow. Trusting, because I had to fully trust how I was going to get out of this. You know, musically, theoretically, you kind of know that if you're at this chord, all you got to do is make your way to the chord of five, and eventually you're going to get back home, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you put yourself into some other other weird place and say, okay, now how are you going to crawl out of this crevice that you just placed yourself in on purpose? And where is this going to go? Mm. Um, it, it, to me, it's like automatic writing. Like when you do that, it's automatic writing, right? Yep. 
Yeah, when you say you're just going to make yourself right for 10 minutes, you have no idea. All you can really do in those times is follow one word to the next. You maybe have a few words ahead, but you don't even necessarily know where the sentence is. You don't know where the thought's going to go, where the paragraph's going to end. To me, that's the same thing that I'm doing with that music. Is With music like that, is I'm just following maybe the phrase. Maybe, you know, maybe it really is just chord to chord to chord. Sometimes still not having, no, uh, doing chord to chord to chord, still not knowing where it's going to go, but trusting that this is where I've been placed, I will lead. I will eventually be led out of this into a place. So there are just so many opportunities to practice that flow within our own context. You know, a lot of people do it with cooking too. They just decide to, oh, we're just going to add a few more splashes in up here and there and see where it ends up. So I think we do practice that stuff. I, some people it comes easier than others. For me, it doesn't necessarily come easy or simple, and yet I can see how um, I've been practicing it in many ways all my life and just challenge myself to keep practicing myself by putting myself into uncomfortable, yeah. dis-ease situations to practice that kind of flow. So what's the connection with creativity then? That there seems to be that's some kind of forced creativity? It, di it is kind of forced creativity for me, I think. Um, because like I said, it can be so easy to get into patterns or to fall into patterns or flow. But creativity is just, is just listening to that flow. It is the same thing. So living a life that flows with spirit is living a life of creativity in all of our own contexts and in our own ways. We get to create, we get to constantly create and but co-create this all the time. We're never creating this fully alone. And we have to be open to the idea of allowing to be, have co-creators along with us, whether that's alongside of us in our communities or whether that's co-creators with spirit in all those different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and once again, that's about letting go of control and trying to figure things out and yeah. flowing with that. Right. I want to come back to, to the body mm -hmm. and how you, like when you were describing that process, it resonated with your body. You, the yes or the no. Can you mm -hmm. say more about that? How you've tuned into being able to trust your body, listen to your body. I don't think there's a magic wand to how to do it. I think you just need to be open to wear it, and then. But I will say, this is how it comes. It comes like this: your awareness, your knowledge, your knowing comes instantly. We figure things out with our brains like this. You know, we kind of do this thought, this thought, this thought, this thought to let it roll down. I think our knowing is so much more instantaneous within us than we give ourselves credit for. We are so used to overriding our own sense of voice, our own purpose. And I often think it's coming back to that triangle again that we were talking about, scripture, tradition, and experience. We're so used to relying on, well, that can't be. Like, it can't, Charlene, no. You can't be that you're going to sleep in another Sunday morning yet again. That can't be. Like, we don't even allow time for that instant knowing of yes or no to come in because we are going there to those other places again. Um, so I think it is just practicing and, and having awareness. I do remember, so I had made this, um, you know, my, my now wife and I had made the decision we were going to open that door. We were going to step forward. We were going to come out. We were going to put our truth out. We were going to put our truth out on the open, not knowing what the next step is. And we had made this decision, and it fully felt right with it. And I remember I was driving along on Napsiger Road, of all places, and I was coming up to an intersection at Phillipsburg. Is that the name of it? Yeah, Phillipsburg. And I was sitting there at the light, and all of a sudden I thought, Charlene, you have made this kind of gut decision within a gut knowing, but you haven't even checked in with yourself, like asked yourself, like, is this the right, like, like I said, I often kind of ask myself these things. You haven't actually asked yourself. And so I asked myself, is this, is this the highest in bed for me? And highest and best good for me? And what I heard was, I could still hear the resounding voice that gives me chills. I heard, yes, 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 yes. Like I didn't just hear a yes. I heard a yes, 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 yelling and pounding in me. And I thought, OK, OK. Maybe I don't even need to kind of check in. It was just, it was affirmation. Like, 
that is so, I don't know, yeah, that sticks with me. That was the strongest yes I've ever heard in my life, for sure. It yelled at me. <laughs> and I'm glad it did. It celebrated with me. That's what the yes was. The yes was celebrating with me. It wasn't needing to give me my affirmation. I already felt like I was fully flowing with, with spirit on this one and fully flowing with where I needed to be, at least at that moment, needing to tell the truth. That fully felt like. But I, that affirmation, to hear that I had a celebratory yes for following my affirmation, no matter what the fallout was going to be from when I actually said the truth out loud, it was, it was awesome. Shifting gears a little bit here. Uh, so there's Christianity, there's many different streams with different understandings and mm -hmm. approaches to divine spirit. You've got the charismatic stream, you've got the contemplative stream, you've got the mystic stream, which is a little different than the contemplative stream, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, you've, you've got the holiness stream, you've got all these and, and traditions, and I'm, I'm wondering what, yeah, if you can speak to what streams or what traditions or, um, and maybe it isn't within the Christian tradition, mm -hmm. but what, what has helped inform and shape your understanding and approach to the spirit? Well, I think, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't say the foundational has been Christian, has been growing up Mennonite and within the Mennonite church. That gave me a foundation. And at the same time, it also, there came a time when I had to add into that story. It wasn't enough for me. It didn't, uh, it's not that it couldn't give me enough. It wasn't resonating enough with me. So I had to go outside to find a, follow those resonances out there. Um, and then so I kind of, you know, dabbled around in, in, in reading and listening to different faith traditions and understandings. Um, I thought maybe it's just the Mennonite Church. So for a while I was going to the United Church. And, um, you know, I, yeah, I ended up just following kind of different paths. But what I see is those are all good bases. They're all good, it's all very informative. And I, I don't see that there's been a, there hasn't been a plus or a minus from anyone. Like I don't think anything's wrong or right. I, the, the fascinating thing for me, the holiest of things for me, is that I see an example of my wife who didn't grow up in a, um, an actively Christian church going home. Um, and I grew up in this kind of very much base within that. And yet, through my journey of looking outside and her journey kind of discovering too within and coming to her own spiritual awareness, we both are at the same place. And that's what I love. This is what, this is what I, wish, I wish as a church we could celebrate. It's not about the place that I was. It's not about the place that she was. It's about the fact that no matter what, there is a universal truth out of that. Then when we all allow ourselves to, to fully live into, our knowledge, live into our knowings within us and that the world is giving back to us, it's there. It's all there. And as I took a step out of, outside the church and then took two steps outside the church, that it surprised me, honestly, because I felt like, I, I felt like it was time to step outside of um, regular church involvement, but I was so entrenched with the idea that that means stepping away from spirit too or stepping away from God, which felt very scary to me. And yet I could see that when I took a step out, it, that was farther from the truth. That just molded. It just still, I, it, just, it just became a lovely, it became a lovely evolving understanding that I couldn't understand in the same way when I thought that it had to be attached for church for me. So it's very valid. Like, I wouldn't be that person, though, if I hadn't been attached to a church, you know, and, and that basis understanding. So all that basis understanding has helped me to grow to where I am today. And I also see from my wife that not having that basis, she's grown to the same place through different sorts of experiences. And that, I think, calls to the fact of being fully open to how that's going to show up for us in many ways. Surprisingly, you know, for me, I kind of went through a period where I was, you know, I, well, 
I will say, not even going through a period. I probably still feel this way. I can be very kind of disgruntled with some of the stuff that the church has done for me and the way that I see the church kind of not living into its wholeness. Um, and she, on the other hand, is the one always reminding me of the goodness within the church, too. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I, it, so to me, that just speaks to this growth awareness, this awareness of just allowing, allowing spirit to shape us how it needs to shape us. Because ultimately, it's all shaping us to be our, our best. Yeah. Yeah, so you, we could talk a long time about <laughs> how <laughs> the church Churches. Has, <laughs> the, the church has missed the mark. Yeah. Let's put it that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on resistance to spirit. Um, does it, that's my assumption is that we can live in resistance to the flow of spirit. And, mm -hmm. and it's difficult to find words for this because I don't want to be judgmental. <laughs> and I'm also a part of the church, but I think it's pretty clear that institutional church has, there's some evidence of resistance to spirit. I'll just put it, mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you can talk in your own life or, or maybe your observations of the resistance from institutional church to the movement of spirit? It's funny, I just, I was listening to a video this week and it was a professor, I think she was a professor of history and I can't remember where she was from, but talking about the fact that institutions are always conservative by nature. And, and, and also, they encourage leaders to be conservative by nature. It just is what happens. So I think that resistance is just kind of built into our our institutions um, and like I said the same conversations I can have a f with a friend or colleague outside the church or on a on a Thursday night feels very different than the same thing if we just come out of a church on a Sunday morning and even just the two of us mm -hmm. there's something about we have that need to defend or I think we just I think underneath it is there's a fear that if the institution would s fall that everything will fall mm -hmm. and there are by, by all means, there are many things tied up in that. But we are not giving enough, we are not giving enough due credit to the spirit we say we profess to trust mm -hmm. by, by resisting that destructive destruction. Mm -hmm. We don't give enough. Like that is the biggest, that was my biggest aha. Like why do we feel like we need to defend we can, we say we are a people of faith. We know we're a people of faith. So this is what faith looks like. Faith looks like destruction. Faith looks like destruction and regrowth. It looks like pulling the weeds up. I remember when my parents split up, I was saying to um, friends of mine that it felt to me like I had lived in this really beautiful garden all my life and that somebody had just come in and just ripped up the plants out of it. And now it was all messy. But at the same time, once those plants were ripped up, that's when I started to see the new growth underneath. That wasn't there when we were all just nicely pat, pat, patting all around, <laughs> around on there. So resistance to spirit, I think, is, is largely that. I don't also think, though, there are times, like, to resist to, resist to spirits is, is, is also very helpful. It's a very informative because it helps you to build up that yes, no courage muscle too, right? Like saying no, I'm going, not going to do this, you know what that feels like in your body to not follow it and that is helpful. So I don't think it's all like, yes, every moment let's just, let's just go with what the flow of the spirit is. We need to know what the opposite feels like too um, or we won't ever really be able to learn to help us go forward. So this is Still My Soul, which is one of the songs um, in the hymnal. And uh, Katie Graber wrote the lyrics for it. So, and, and I love the lyrics that she wrote for it. I really appreciate it. Um, so the story behind this tune is I was doing a part of a group that met for kind of meditation, silence time every few weeks. And it was one of those regular Tuesday morning slots. And we had had our 20 minutes of silence. And we came through from the 20 minutes of silence. And I said, I just, a song came to me. And so I, 
um, went over the piano and I sat down and I played it. And this was the song that it came to me. And then that was years ago and I just, I went home and I recorded it for myself just so I had a record of it and I put it aside. And then when they opened up ideas, uh, submissions for the new hymnal, I thought, I put a few ones in and I thought I'm going to put this one in and this is the one that they, one of the ones that they included. So, um, this is still my soul. <laughs> 